Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim, and <clears throat> I'd like to thank the organizers of Intelligence Squared and everyone here for joining us tonight. Monty Python's Meaning of Life, a film. It contains a scene, there's an obese chap, really a caricature of obesity, Mr. Creosote. He walks into a restaurant, apparently it's his regular local. He orders everything on the menu and a Jeroboam of champagne. After all this, the waiter offers him just one wafer thin mint to round off the meal. He momentarily hesitates. Then Mr. Creosalt consumes said mint. He promptly explodes. For me, that is the danger that settlement overreach poses to Israel. Eventually, it will explode in our faces. Just one more wafer thin outpost. Just a little E1. I will now devote my remaining remarks to those of you not familiar with Monty Python's The Meaning of Life. Look, there is a certain powerful logic to the idea that Israel as we know it simply cannot coexist with the relentless continuation and expansion of settlements in contravention of international law. Let's look at it like this. Imagine there's a triangle made up of three sides of the basic choices that Israel faces. One is a state with a Jewish character, drawn, amongst other things, from a clear majority of its citizenry being Jewish. The second line is an Israel that is democra recognizably democratic observing democratic norms, respecting democratic rights, adhering to the international conventions it signed, investing that democracy with meaning. And the third is an Israel that has all the territory, the territory of the biblical home, if you like, the territory now under its control, the territory across which settlements are spread, as those previous maps showed. But in fact, Israel can only have two sides of this triangle. It can be democratic and Jewish in character, but not have all the territory. Or it can have all the territory and choose to give up either its democratic character or its Jewish character. For with the territory comes its inhabitants, and they can either be accorded democratic rights or denied those rights. It's a relatively simple equation. I prefer to say it's irrefutable and send us all home early, but let's dig a little deeper. There are those who accept this basic premise, who accept, yes, two states. I'm not sure we'll hear that position tonight, but you hear it often. But they then say, chill out about settlements, the chill out camp. They're just not a big deal. You exaggerate their significance. They can always be removed. There are bigger problems. If you want to do two states, what about the historical narratives? What about rejectionism on both sides, security? Really, the settlements? I would argue the opposite. If you're arguing from a two-state perspective, the single most prohibitive factor to achieving a two-state outcome, I would say, is the settlement enterprise. The single biggest practical, on-the-ground driving force toward the indivisibility of this land is the settlements. Even if the built-up area of settlements takes up only a small area, the truth is it's about 1% of the West Bank, but the area under settlement jurisdiction, the municipal and regional settlement councils control the zoning and planning, that's 42.8% of the West Bank. Settlements help define Palestinian access, or actually lack of access, to land, to resources, even to quarries, and Palestinian freedom of movement. And this picture becomes even more stark if one factors in patterns of, set patterns of settlement and land expropriation in Palestinian East Jerusalem, making the viability of a future Palestinian state all the more impossible. And settlements define a cognitive map in people's minds, encouraging the world and the Palestinians to give up on a two-state outcome, or at least consider it a vanishing prospect. 
There is a variation on the chill out crowd, which is this, that the two state model is okay with settlements because it can accommodate any amount of settlement growth. The Palestinians can swallow any deal. Their territory can shrink to whatever enfeebled islet it is willing to be offered, whatever infringement on their resources and sovereignty. Let's not delude ourselves. The Palestinian leadership accepted the idea of a mini-state on 22% of the land, not the 43% of the partition plan. If you want to go along with the idea of some element of victor's justice and rejectionist's remorse, I don't think there's much room for further retreat. There is a point at which the aspiration for Palestinian statehood under such limited circumstances becomes less attract attractive to Palestinians. And the appeal of a one-state democracy carries the day. This is true already for many Palestinians, and settlements bring that day closer for many more. Thanks very much, Tim. What if, no, no, I haven't finished. <laughs> I'm gonna use my 25 minutes, no. Uh, thanks a lot. But you could say, what if you look beyond the traditional two-state paradigm? Is that the only solution you can come up with? Not one where there's no Israel, but one maybe there's a confederation, maybe something like Belgium, maybe something involving Jordan. I think it's clear that settlement policy reduce the, reduces the prospects of all these alternatives. Why would a Palestine that's part of a confederation or part of something to do with Jordan be any more willing to base itself on atomized islands of land without resources, surrounded and with security arrangements dictated only by one side? You know, there is a reason that two former Israeli prime ministers, Ehud Barak and Ehud Olmert, and Israel's, I guess, cultural icon, Amos Oz, have, have spoken of an approaching reality of South African style apartheid. But I, as I said, I'm not sure these are going to be the main arguments we're going to hear tonight. So let's not make it easy on ourselves. Let's step out of this comfortable paradigm. What if I am getting it all wrong? What if, like the toy store, settlements are us? There's no difference between pre-67 and post-67. One side of the green line and another side of the green line. That far from destroying Israel, settlement policy simply encapsulates the very essence of what Israel is. After all, Ramat Aviv, Tel Aviv University is built on the ruins of the Palestinian village of Sheikh Munas. And there's, the list can go on. I can certainly understand that from a Palestinian's experience, such distinctions might well appear to be rather arbitrary and not very relevant. Green line, not green line. And a Palestinian might have rather less interest in whether Israel is destroying itself or not, as compared to, say, whether Palestinian rights and freedoms are able to be exercised. But we don't have Palestinian speakers with us here today. I can't be an advocate for Palestinians. William can't. Messrs. Diane and Glick may enjoy settling Palestinian land, but I don't know if that makes them advocates for the Palestinians. I hope a future debate will invite Palestinians. But, and there is, of course, such a perspective held in the Israeli Zionist discourse that Israel equals settlements, which could render our debate meaningless. And I admit that to some, such a definition of Israel may sound more coherent, more compelling, even more honest. But there's a problem here, because that is not how Israel has defined itself. Israel calls itself a democracy, a Jewish and democratic state. It enshrined these principles in its declaration of independence. It is a signatory to international charters that enshrines these principles. The Israel that has embedded itself in the community of nations and in the hearts and minds of Jews and others across the world is the democratic Israel. That carries the legitimacy. That is the Israel that has also, on the 67 lines, been recognized by the PLO itself. So unless and until Israel redefines itself, let's say we call it the Jewish empire of greater Israel, until then, 
That is the standard against which one has to measure whether Israel is destroying itself with settlements or not. There is a democratic recession going on in Israel. I would argue that the settlements drive that democratic recession. It's impossible to sustain a democracy on one side of a green line if you're managing a not in democracy on the other. There could be an opening. Maybe this can just be a binational democracy. It's the 21st century, percentages of Jews, percentages of non-Jews, really? This is what we have to bother ourselves with. But again, would that be called Israel? Does it not answer the definition of this debate? I want to finally say the following. And I want to be careful not to turn the oy vey dial up too high. But I think one can argue that settlement policy is a driving factor in Israel endangering itself, not just in the sense of defining what Israel is, but also in a very real physical sense. That settlements constitute a high-risk strategy for the security and well-being of Israelis and Israel. That settlements are the greatest barrier between Israel and pragmatic policies, between Israel and realistic policies, especially in the reality we face today. Let's just look at it. A new Arab reality in which democratic enfranchisement has come to the fore. A reality in which technological gaps, including Israel's qualitative military edge, are narrowing over time. A reality in which Israel is so dependent on the US, sorry, and the Pacific Island states, in which Palestinian non-violent civil disobedience gathers steam but also in which armed uprisings against oppression have received regional and international support in Syria, Libya, and elsewhere, and in which Israel is losing its legitimacy and experiencing a brain drain at home. In that reality, are settlements not the greatest manifestation of overreach? The reason why we have an Israel without borders? <clears throat> are settlements the way forward? Do they contribute to Israeli security? Or do they threaten to push Israel over the edge? And is this our only future? Is it really a viable future to live by the sword in perpetuity? I'll close by saying this. I, I can see them. There are some speech bubbles coming out of some people's heads. Naive, naive, naive. The man's a defeatist. If we ended the settlements, would the Arabs really accept us? They opposed us before 67, after 67. With them, to live in peace? To me, that's the defeatism. To believe that there is no better future. Are the Palestinians uniquely intolerant? Uniquely impossible to make peace with? Are we uniquely destined to be enemies forever? I'd argue that that view is ahistorical is a misreading of reality, and it's a more than a little bit prejudiced. Unique, permanent unreasonableness does not apply to Palestinians or Muslims. It does not apply to Jews or Israelis. If we remove the Casas belly, the burning humiliation of today and tomorrow, will everything still be dictated by the humiliations of yesterday and history? Both peoples can be forward-looking. And to support this motion is to send a message that settlements are taking us to a point of no return. Not a smart strategy for Israel's future. Thank you.